Hello everyone, welcome back to Realism Overhaul Sandbox in Kerbal Space Program 1.8.1. In a previous video I mentioned that none of the lander proposals for the Artemis program had actually been optimal for the Moon or for NASA's Space Launch System, SLS. And to that end I'm going to explain why and also introduce my own idea and I'll explain why this is optimal. And so here is the Kumo. Kumo is Japanese for spider, and the reason for naming that is readily obvious from the shape of it. But the shape of it is also predetermined by various factors. It is all very logical, even though it looks sort of sci-fi-ish. And let's just go through the requirements for what we actually want out of a moon lander. The moon has water, uh, and we intend to use that water to refuel our landers and fuel other systems like fuel cells and stuff like that. But we take the water, we use electrolysis, split it into hydrogen and oxygen. So what we want is landers that use hydrogen and oxygen, especially on the part that we are going to reuse, which is the ascent stage. And the ascent stage will actually eventually become both the descent and ascent stage. Initially, we are going to need something that has an ascent stage and a separate descent pack if you will. In this case, we have drop tanks. And ultimately, what we want to do is move away from using the drop tanks and have the ascent stage use its propellant to land, descend, do the descent part, refuel on the surface, and then ascend. So then we won't need to use the descent tanks anymore. So then we don't need this part anymore at that point. We can just leave that off. This will land exactly as it is and refuel on the surface. But we are still not there yet. So while we cannot refuel on the surface, we need the descent pack. So the Dynetics lander, the Dynetics proposal was very close to this. It had drop tanks and it had a core section and that core section would function as the ascent portion, but it was the wrong propellant. It was methane and oxygen. This hurt them in two ways. First of all, it can't refuel on the surface. Second of all, it didn't have the performance necessary for them to get a positive amount of mass. Uh, so in other words, they were sort of net negative on the system and they couldn't explain why. And that was a big problem during the contract phase. So hydrogen and oxygen is very efficient. And as a result, we can make the system work. Another thing about that, the Dynetics Lander is it had a lot of extra structure on it for no apparent reason. I don't know why it had all that structure. So that was the de de deficiency of the Dynetics Lander, the wrong propellant. Right basic idea though. Uh, I didn't like the arrangement uh, with everything being so far outboard though. This is a lot tighter, as you can see. Uh, with the National Team Lander, the right propellant, the hydrogen and oxygen, was on the descent stage. The part that is going to be dumped and not reused. Now, this ultimately is an efficient choice because if you use the other propellants that they were using, the hypergolic propellants in the descent stage, it makes it much heavier. Remember, the uh, hydrogen and oxygen is very efficient, but this did not help with the whole reusability thing. So that was the problem there. And overall, it was sort of ungainly. Uh, but uh, then there's, of course, Starship, Lunar Starship, which uses methane and oxygen. So it's not refuelable on the moon, not for a very, very long time. Uh, carbon extraction on the moon, uh, we're talking about uh, this trace amount parts per million. You would have to process maybe 3 million tons of stuff in order to get uh, what you need for st one Starship refueling. It's something on that order. So, yeah... That's not something that's happening anytime soon. But yeah, let's talk about the Kumo. So I've sort of explained the rationale for this. It uses hydrogen and oxygen. You can see the very big hydrogen tanks there, oxygen tanks here. They must be placed where they are. Uh, the oxygen tanks have to be really close to the center of mass because the they are heavy. And as they deplete, that will throw off the center of mass if they are not right on it. And actually, uh, you can sort of tell that the center mass is between these two thrusters. So, yeah, it's running along like that. And so the oxygen tank is just a little bit back from that. And that's to compensate for the mass of the hydrogen tanks. So the thrusters, uh, the engines are, of course, spaced equally from the center of mass. And the engines are 30 kilonewton engines. 
I have used the stats of the common extensible cryogenic engine, which is a configuration of the RL10, and basically split it in two. So each of these is 460 seconds specific impulse, which is very high efficiency, but the common extensible cryogenic engine had that, and it is half the size of the common extensible cryogenic engine, and throttles down to 10%. The CC, as I call it, uh, throttled down to 7%, which is even better. So this is a milder sort of take, but yeah, this will work out for this particular lander. If we take a look at this portion, and we have to orient it like this for looking at the stats in the, in the SPH here, uh, 3,000 meters per second would be enough to ascend from the moon and also get back to Lunar Gateway. Actually, this actually has to do the final bit of descent. I'm estimating about 200 meters per second for that, maybe as much as 300, and then uh, 2,100 to get back into lunar orbit, which is plenty. Uh, minimum would be 1,800, and then another 500 to get back to 500 to 600 to get back to Lunar Gateway, uh, and then it, uh, that's not including the RCS available. It has uh, roughly 0.8 tons of RCS. So the RCS is MH and MON3, that will have to be refueled from Earth. So we just went with existing thrusters for that. The engines are potentially what uh, Blue Origin was expecting from the BE-7 engine. And so if they make that, that'll work. But if they don't, hopefully somebody else will make something like this. Dry mass. The dry mass of this is 7.93 tons with the food, water, and oxygen. Uh, so we still have that in. Uh, if we dump that, it's a little bit less. Uh, by comparison, so uh, 7.57 tons. Now, by comparison, the Apollo lunar lander was 2.7 tons. That carried two people and had the propellant tanks built in, as well as the engines built in and RCS thrusters. That's the ascent portion only. So the ascent portion of the Apollo lunar lander, 2.7 tons for two people, all the tanks, and the engines and such. And docking port. Uh, so this is four people, and we ha clearly have more margin. Uh, we're not simply doubling the Apollo Lunar Lander. We have plenty of margin on this. We do have larger tanks, but we have greater efficiency on those tanks. So the physical size of the tanks proportionally might not be that big, and because we have the better efficiency engines. So, but the the tanks for the Apollo Lunar Lander were fairly dense. Uh, I'm reasonably confident that this can be done in this mass, so. And the good thing about this is that in the context of using this with the space launch system is that it's potentially possible. Uh, the SLS is a little bit underwhelming as far as being able to pull this off is concerned, but it is possible to co-manifest this, this portion with Orion and have Orion pull this into orbit around the moon. I think that is possible. We will have to test it, but it is 17.789 tons as you can see. And if we add the food, water, and oxygen at the station instead of in here and then just moved it in once we get to the station, that would make things maybe mildly a little bit better. But we're talking about maybe 22 tons for the Orion and its service module and nearly 18 tons here, so it's 40 tons instead of the capacity of SLS with the EUS, which is uh, 37 to 38 tons. So we're asking a little bit of extra from Block 1B in order to do this. But if it can, uh, these expansion tanks are only 15.64 tons, and so they can be delivered separately and then attached. So uh, an arm on Lunar Gateway, well, once this is docked to Lunar Gateway, uh, Orion will uh, pull it in, but then it will uh, crew will get in there and dock it independently. It won't dock with, I mean, because Orion only has one docking port anyway. Uh, so it will dock it independently, and then an arm will attach. This thing's docking port is on this side, and there's the crew hatch and everything. And then uh, once this arrives, an arm will just dock it like that. And so that can be delivered separately. And... We'll need some way of refueling this portion. This can be delivered with its fuel, of course, but probably some other fuel tank. Oh, I need to shift that up. I need to adjust the attachment node for that. But yeah, uh, some fuel will have to be sent to refuel this until we get a surface base that can refuel it. 
and that will have to be separate from this. So that is the idea, and that way you can use SLS with Orion and these modules, because with hydrogen and oxygen, you can get the landers small enough so that they can be co-manifested with Orion. Here we, we have a somewhat heavy lander, and I'm sure if it was those smaller cabins that they had, with those, if you just wanted those instead of this fancy one, then you could possibly get it easily within the limit of uh, S less block 1b. So anyway, that's the idea. And it provides us with a future around the moon because this can continue to be used and reused around the moon. And now the question is whether this model can actually work in Kerbal Space Program. Completely different situation. This is not a trivial thing. Let's just bring it outside and talk about the situation here. Okay, so here it is, and we're just going to cheat it into orbit around the moon and work from there. And we actually want to be in an elongated orbit around the moon, a high orbit, just to test that out. Okay, well, this will have to do. So here we have a 30,000 kilometer apoapsis. Uh, the periapsis is a little bit high, though, but uh, we'll adjust that and use that to make up the difference. Now we were recharging there, but really the solar panels on the top of the vehicle, which we can barely see right now, are meant for just maintaining charge while on the surface without using fuel cells, basically sort of in a hibernation state. Uh, they aren't really meant... So the RCS thrusters are working. This is not trivial, by the way. Uh, this model didn't even load in 1.12. That's why I'm in 1.8.1. Uh, when we do the loading for Kerbal Space Program, it was not wanting to load it. And I've had that problem with two other models, the Orange and the Chandrayaan lander. The Orange was meant to land lunar base modules, and the Chandrayaan lander is the Indian lunar lander um, probe. But it's weird that 1.12 seems to hate lunar lander is so much, but uh, anyway, we're recharging right now. So yeah, that's why I'm in 1.8.1. I don't know why that is. Uh, I don't know what else they have in common. They are all, I mean, this one in particular is very complicated. We have, it's sort of the kiss of death for a uh, Kerbal mod in that we have all the things built into one part. Normally for Kerbal Space Program, one part has a decover module, one part has a engine module, one part has a RCS module, one part has a solar panel module, one part is a lander leg, and they're all separate parts, and a separate part for the fuel tanks, and this has it all built into one thing, so it's phenomenally complicated. So we want to control from this docking port. By the way, the shape of the bottom tanks, and I'm sorry it's not very clear right now, but the, the reason why they're curved like this is to fit into the diameter of SLS, the 8.4 meter diameter. With a 10 meter diameter fairing, it would fit easily into, but the reason it's curved like that is to make sure it all fits in the 8.4 meter diameter if this was all being sent together. Of course, the nominal mission plan is for the two bits to be sent separately, but it could be launched to the moon altogether. It is uh, under the maximum mass for SLS Block 1b to send to the moon, so it could be sent as a payload to the moon, and in that case, we want it to fit inside the 8.4 meter diameter. That also means it's launchable by Starship, and so if we have a hydrogen-oxygen stage in Starship with it, uh, perhaps mounted at a tail here, uh, that could work, uh, and that could transfer it over to the moon as well. So both ways can work. And one thing we, okay, well, we want to retrograde here. So I'm glad the RCS thrusters are firing. We do want to enable staging on the docking port so that we can separate as necessary. I'm not reading the delta V. Oh, fuel prioritization is also a thing that we need to do. Let's make sure that. So the lander has a lower priority than this. And now it's showing the right numbers. Okay. So let's see about the balance here. So we have these high-mounted thrusters, and that helps with uh, touchdowns so that we don't have 
too much regolith issues. Um, no, we still need more. And they have 50 ignitions. That's from uh, from the common extensible cryogenic engine. We just borrowed that. I'm assuming that this will be okay for avoiding the tank package down here, but we might need some protector plates that could add a little bit of mass down here for the descent tanks. I have not uh, given them EVA capability on this right now. I need to do that. I have to add the ladder thing and the hatch thing. They're little boxes, interactable boxes. Well, anyway, the good news is it seems to be balanced right now. Need to make sure that's the case even with the descent tanks on. Okay, that's a low enough periapsis. Alright, let's go down and make sure we are recharging. Yeah, I don't know why the panels charge so much. I set them to 0.75 kilowatts, 750 watts, because there's 5 meters squared of them on top of this. And they're just supposed to be for standby electricity. I'll need to add the fuel cells in too, I didn't really do that. Fuel cells are obvious an obvious choice since we're using hydrogen and oxygen already. Okay, so going down. As mentioned, the interior is the same as the interior that I made for the other vessels. So it's just like this with the Kerbals floating up because the seats are sized to humans. And we can see the tanks beside us, the hydrogen tanks. And we've got all our instrumentation, so it's all good there. I can make that cockpit more complicated if that seems desirable. Since our periapsis is on the nighttime side, I'll bring this down into a low orbit first and then effectuate the landing, I think. Did I forget the I forgot the MLI layers again, shoot. I might have to work on these plumes. Okay, well, I don't want to cut it any closer than that. That's a uh, fine standby orbit. We have, as you can see, just about as much delta V as surface velocity, but again, the lander is going to have to finish the landing. Okay, well, I do want to land in light, so ignition. Okay. I think we'll need some pitch up here. I, I delayed a little bit before this burn. It's rocking a lot, so I'm just gonna manually control it, I think. Of course, this lander very much reflects my my desire not to have a tall lander <laughs> after many, many, many tilt-overs on the moon. We need extra time so that we can dispense with the descent tanks. Again, all the hydrogen is bulky, but it's also very light, so that's why everything is the way it is. Our center of mass is back here with the oxygen tanks. Might be nice to land over here. Well, I guess over here is fine too. The crater is not as cratery as I was worried about. Okay, drop tank off. On the mock-up that helped me determine the mass of it, I also did include the landing legs. I used the stock landing leg scaled up, so there should be landing leg margin as well. The engines are sized appropriately so that we can throttle down and our descent rate increases in this situation. Okay, we are down. All right, so again, I haven't made the hatch as such yet, but uh, we have 2,557. Let's just make sure we can get back to orbit and to a high orbit as well. So off we go. I'm just going to go 90 degrees with it. 
Well, they'd sure get a nice look at the surface in this position. Uh, yeah, Smart ASS likes to gyrate a lot. I'm gonna try SAS here. I mean, we shouldn't be hitting any limits, but they just like to wiggle both control systems. We seem to have an imbalance of hydrogen and oxygen. I'll have to check up on that. I thought I had the CC configuration correct. So I used the common extensible cryogenic engine as a basis. I fueled the tanks based on that. So I don't know why we should have a uh, imbalance. So I'll take a look. So that only hurts efficiency. So you can only do better than this. I don't think we were hanging out long enough for boil off to have killed that much hydrogen, but who knows. Boil off is always the thing. And perhaps uh, plates underneath the tanks to protect them from the thrust of the engines would be a good idea too. Okay, well we are in roughly a 60 by 30 orbit. We have 668 meters per second left and that should definitely be enough to get to Lunar Gateway. That's not including our RCS propellant, so we have some extra delta V like that. We also need to rebalance the hydrogen and oxygen. We had some inefficiency there, so we have more margin than it seems. But this is my lander proposal. <laughs> this is what I, th I think would be optimal given all the criteria. and as a long-term prospect for bringing four people down to the surface. Not a lot of cargo. There are other vehicles for that. Uh, you know, this is just four people. Very simple, reusable, refuelable on the surface kind of thing. So that was what I was going for and this is what I got. So with that, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below and I'll see you next time.